Welcome to another episode of the Troubadour Podcast. Today we're going to do something a little bit different than look at poetry. We're going to look at a novel. The novel we're going to look at is uh, a novel by Daniel Defoe called Maul Flanders. Maul Flanders. Here's the full title. The Fortunes and Misfortunes of the Famous Maul Flanders, who was born in Newgate and during a life of continued variety for three score years, besides her childhood, was twelve years a whore, five times a wife, whereof once to her brother, twelve years a thief, eight years a transported felon in Virginia, at last grew rich, lived honest, and died a penitent. We're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, title in just a moment. One of the things I want to talk first about with Maul Flanders, so why you should even watch this video if you want to continue watching is first and foremost, this is a, a novel that many people really don't like, and they didn't like it when it was written. It was it, it was not a huge success. This was written after Daniel Defoe's famous, um, you know, most famous work, Robinson Crusoe, which again you get one of these long titles, the life and strange sufferings, strange and surprising adventures of Robinson Crusoe, who went on and this and this and this, where basically he lays out the plot of the story in the uh, title, and then you you know read the plot unveiling in more detail. Now a lot of people don't like Maul Flanders, and you know for a variety of reasons. One, some of them don't like the style. Um, although the style is the style that is somewhat dominant in our own era, and we'll talk a little bit about this. But what's most interesting to me is that people hate it because they hate the character of Maul Flanders, and they don't like what the decisions she makes. And you heard a taste of it in that introduction, right? Like she marries her brother for at one point. And... I think it's a justified, understandable reaction to this character, to Maul Flanders. But I do think it is um, a little hasty to simply write Maul Flanders as a book and a character off merely because the character took actions that you otherwise, you yourself may not have taken. So I'm going to, you know, tell you five basic reasons why I think it might be worthwhile for you to consider reading Maul Flanders. And a couple things of why maybe you shouldn't read it, for one. One is it is an older book, so some of the words are going to be somewhat challenging, but not too challenging. Another thing is that <laughs> I'm not 100% sure the reason, but um, you know, I, I think it was because this was an early novel. It's just the way it goes. But and, and so you see this sometimes with early novels. I, we talked about this if you saw my episodes on Benito Sereno, where it's basically 100 pages, no breaks. And it's the same thing with this book. There are no, I don't know if you could see this, but and if you're listening to it, you obviously can't see it, but there are no chapters anywhere, no chapters. It's just 230 pages of straight text, 250 actually or more in my, in my version. So it's a long book that just kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, or not a long book, but it, you know, at, at the time it might have seemed, or today it might seem somewhat long, but it's not really that long. Okay, so uh, you know, some reasons not to is I think she's not the most inspiring character. So if you're looking for an inspirational read, that's this isn't going to be the one for you. Um, but I think there's so much value in reading books like this. And that goes into the little text here at the top. If you are watching this on YouTube or Facebook, um, I am now hosting the Literary Canon Club. And so you should RSVP. We have, as I'm editing or recording this, you know, I don't know if there's going to be enrollment or not um, when you watch this. And so enrollment happens at certain periods where we allow six to eight people in at a time. But you need to RSVP to get into that list and be able to be allowed into our small groups. And what we do with the Literary Canon Club is we read through the entire literary canon in the Western world from the Iliad to Gatsby. And there's something like 57 works. Now, you don't have to read the whole thing with us. You can do it in sections and choose not to do other sections. I've kind of broken it down to help you do that. But the point is, 
If you've ever thought that you want to read more great literature, this is an opportunity to get the you know the literature education I think all of us should have gotten in school, uh, but we didn't get. So check that website out. It's troubadourmag.com backslash literary canon club or literary dash canon dash club. If you just Google that, it'll pop up. If you Google troubadourmag.com backslash literary canon club. Okay, so let's get into this book a little bit. And what is interesting about the book and and why I think it is worth reading. The first reason is that you get to visit 17th century London. Many people accuse novels and literary art as being escapism. I don't think escapism is the right word to use. I think that's an improper word. But it captures something. And the reason it captures something is because when you escape, you're leaving one place to go to another place. And that aspect of literature is true. It is a journey into another location. And the better you get at reading, the better you do take on that journey. Now, this 17th century is perhaps not the perspective of London that you always want to see, but it is a reality of the kind of London that Daniel Defoe came from himself and what he he was a journalist for much of his life and what he documented. So let me show you a picture. Give me one second. If you're watching, if you're not, the picture is The Egg Dance, Peasants and Merry Making by Jan uh, Steen. I believe it's called Jan Steen. And she, or I think it's a she, I hope it's a she, could be a guy. I, I didn't look into that well enough. But if you're watching this, you could see this picture and, or this painting, excuse me, by, I believe, a Dutch painter. And you see all these people in revelry. And this is a, you even see like a little child in the corner with a little dog and you know, uh, playing with eggs. And this is a an Easter tradition. But in the back, you could see a lot of merrymaking. You could see people going up the stairs where you can assume some debauchery is going on. You see a guy over here kind of contemplating life. But this is a kind of, you know, vision or view of uh, one aspect of 17th century London or, you know, uh, life at this time of peasants that I think is interesting as a backdrop to what's going on in the story of Maul Flanders. So that's kind of setting it up. We're going to talk about what the plot and the story is about in a moment. But this is kind of one aspect of the world, I'll just say the world that Maul Flanders is coming from or, or, or is where she's born from in a sense. So that, that I think is an important context to what's happening with Maul Flanders. And so when you visit 17th century London, you're going to visit different aspects of it, but you're also going to visit a little bit of the, um, you know, debauched side of it, the, the side that's about merrymaking, that's, you know, prostitution and, and you know, being a loose woman occasionally or things of that nature. And we can talk about what that, uh, you know, looks like in the story. And, but I do think it's worthwhile to take the transportation, to take the little journey and to visit 17th century London, even if it's not the nicest parts of town all the time, it I think it does have value to kind of see what this is like. And it doesn't take that long. The book may be 260 pages, but it's not, you know, and there are some hard words, but it's not the hardest book to read at all. You could read it, you know, if you really wanted to in a, in a couple sittings. Okay, so this goes into our second reason to check out this book, is you get to meet in really great detail this immoral woman who leads an interesting life. Now, I put immoral because I think it's an, you know, depends on what you mean by morality. So Christi Christians definitely see her as immoral, but I think there's some interesting questions to ask in her, her situation. So let me read this title again a little bit slower. And I want you to kind of think about that, you know, this is essentially the plot. This is her life. So one value of reading literature, especially novels or epic poetry, is that you get to see an entire life or a big part of an entire life that you can't see or even experience in your own life. So we cannot do this with our own life. Even with our memories, we'd have to experience it first, 
but we will never be able to sit on you know a, a Mount Olympus and look at our life from birth until death. You know, we can write our memoirs when we're in our 90s and we're dying, but that's when it's already been lived. We can't do it in, you know, pro, uh, you know, in in um in advance, obviously. And there is a value in reading novels that you get to see an entire life lived out. And that can kind of give you guidelines and signposts in your own life. Like there is a very practical reason I think that people overlook when it comes to reading novels. And of course, it's not the only reason to read novels, but it's just one. So here's the title again. The, let's see if I can pop this up. Here we go. The Fortunes and Misfortunes of the Famous Mall Flanders. So one, we get the sense that there's fortunes and misfortunes. So her life has ups and downs, right? Now, here's who was born in Newgate. Newgate was a prison. So she was born in a prison. And we find out in page one that her mother, Mall Flanders' mother, was uh, scheduled to be hung. And she claimed the belly, it's called. And claiming the belly means that they won't hang a pregnant woman. And so she, you know, all women or most women would do this if they were going to be hung in the hopes that they could, you know, and, and sometimes they would even, you know, try to sleep with men ahead of time because uh, sometimes there would be mingling in the prisons uh, and conjugal visits, I guess you could have, you know, at least in this novel, there are men who meet the women. And... So it would be a common tactic. I mean, if I was a woman, I would definitely try and take that tactic, right? Like I would definitely sleep with guys in hopes that I would get pregnant and then say, you can't kill me because I'm pregnant. And then sometimes, um, which happened with Maul's mother, she got taken, she, she was able to be uh, let go after Maul was um, born. But she was given up for adoption. So Maul Flanders, who was born in prison in Newgate, and during a life of continued variety. So her life is all over the place. There's a variety of things that happen to her. For three score years, I think that's 60 years, um, besides her childhood. So she lives like into her 70s. So she lives into her 70s. We know she's going to survive. She's not going to get killed all of a sudden, um, you know, at, at, on page 40 or when she's 40 years old. This, this goes into her 70s. Um, was 12 years a whore. Now, not necessarily all at once. We just know that she lived as a whore. And by whore, he means a literal prostitute, not like a slut, but a prostitute. Like she made money from uh, sex. Five times a wife. So she was a wife five times, whereof once to her brother. So she married her brother? What? I remember when I read that, I was like, wait a second. Wait a second. What is going on with this woman's life? Where, you know, uh, where of once to her brother? 12 years a thief, eight years a transported felon in Virginia. This is also a really interesting uh, historical fact, which is another reason to read older books, is history is a value to learn about. And one thing that you know we, we hear about in history, but we don't really visualize it, is the idea that America was basically the trash of Europe, right? That's where they would send all their felons and their murderers and their robbers and the people that they didn't want anything to do with. They sent them to Virginia, right? They sent them to the colonies. You, won't, you, don't, you don't want these people in Europe? Get them out of here and put them, you know, uh, send them to America, which gives you a different perspective when you think about how the crown must have felt in 1776 when they're like, wait, what are these criminals doing fighting us? Like, what are they doing? Um, so, you know, you get a kind of a sense of, there's a historical sense of an importance of reading novels, which gives us a sense of our own history that wasn't that long ago. I mean, in your life, it was a long time, but in the life of humanity, it wasn't, that was a couple hundred years ago. Okay, let me finish up this title. So transported, you know, eight years, a transported felon in Virginia at last grew rich. So she grew rich. She lived honest. You know, at some point, we find out this is pretty late in her life when she lives honest. And she died a penitent. So um, that's somebody who's, you know, apologetic for the life that they lived. Now, this whole novel is written in first person. But what's interesting about it is um, it's written, at, you know, as Maul Flanders in her penitent phase. So it's part of her being penitent later in life 
reflecting on her earlier life. So one of the interesting perspectives of reading the novel is seeing the two kind of characters interplaying within her, uh, within the, the writing, within the style. And what's actually going on is sometimes she's like, you know, I, she'll say something like, I, um, I should have, you know, looking back, I, I took less money for sex than I should have, but I thought that maybe he really was in love with me, right? When she was really young. Uh, and, and so it was like this really interesting where she's supposed to be penitent. Uh, and this is one reason why people don't like this book because she, is she really penitent? Like what is she doing here when she writes these things? Uh, personally, I'll have to say that I, I really enjoyed the story. Um, I, I think, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get into a couple reasons of why I like the story, but you know, just kind of giving you an overview of the Maul Flanders character. Now, this whole idea of Maul Flanders as an immoral woman who leads an interesting life. So you've seen that life that she leads. And part of what occurs in the novel, the plot is simply she starts off as a, you know, a, a, a abandoned child who is put into this system and she isn't able to get out of the system, you know, the adoption system. And at this time, 17th century London, this was not like being adopted in America today, right? The, this was a hard life she was going to live. She had no options. Now, I want to read you like a quick little thing that I think sets up the novel and um, gives you the context for the kind of life that she wants to live and the fact that she has no options, which I think is a true fact. So it kind of goes into how can you judge this character? Like, and, and I don't mean like, how can you judge this character? But I mean, you know, how do you do the act of judging a character in this particular situation? What should she have done? What action should she have taken in this context? So let me read this to you. Now, this happens very, very early. When um, she's a, a young girl, she's, I don't remember her exact age, but she's like, preteen, right? She's in her, she's like nine, eight or nine or even younger. And there's this whole concept of she wants to be a gentlewoman. And she's this, you know, ragged little girl living in an adoption agency, learning how to, to sew for money, essentially, because of child labor, there's no laws against it. And um, she tells everybody, you know, in that, that she wants to be a gentlewoman. And the people, the townspeople think it's adorable. Oh, you're going to be a gentlewoman? No, you're not. Oh, <laughs> cute. Because she's poor. You can't be a gentlewoman if you're born as in, a, in this situation. Now, there's a confusion. So the real gentlewomen in the story in the early part, they uh, take a kind of liking to her in a funny way at first because she is cute and she's very adorable and she grows up to be a very beautiful woman. So that's part of the value she does offer. But she, um, you know, she wants to be a, a gentlewoman. And here's what she says about the confusion. And this is, again, the old woman writing, but she's writing from the perspective of herself as a little girl. Um, and all the rest of them did not understand me at all, for they meant one sort of thing by the word gentlewoman, and I meant quite another. For, alas, all I understood by being a gentlewoman was to be able to work for myself and get enough to keep me without that terrible bugbear going to service, whereas they meant to live great, rich, and high, and I know not what. So what she's saying here, and what she goes on to talk about, is that the only option she really does have at this era in, in existence as a woman born without family. So a gentlewoman has to be taken care of by someone else. That's what it means to be a gentlewoman, is you don't have to work, essentially. She, as being a commoner, born into this adoption agency, or the, the, this um, foster care place, is going to have to work her entire life for somebody else. And that's what she wants to avoid. Not, now, she says that she doesn't want to, she's, it's not that she's afraid of work, although she may be. I mean, this, this is a question you have to ask yourself but that she doesn't want to work for other people. She wants to be independent. And I think this is a, the crux of understanding Maul Flanders as a character, is that she starts with this 
wanting to be, uh, you know, independent. And my sense is that she's genuine, that she genuinely wants to be this, that in today's era, she would be an independent uh, entrepreneurial type of woman. And you can see this even with the way her, the machinations of her mind work, that she's constantly trying to find the best ways to come out of, you know, her, the way her mind works is she's always trying to figure out ways to make things work. Usually, you know, it does end up being in her favor, but she always thinks in, in four or five different dimensions about, well, if I do this, this will happen. If I do that, this will happen. If I do, And she's very conniving in that sense. But my sense, this is just my take, is that possibly that type of mentality, if it was put into a more rational setting where she could apply it in a positive way to running a business, to doing, you know, to finding ways to run a good business and be a healthier way. If that was one of her options, she may have had a better chance at life. But because of the situation she was in, where she could either, um, well, she had only one option. She could lie in order to live that kind of life, a, a, a rich life, or she could work and by work, there was no chance, no chance, no woman, um, you know, and very few men work at like sewing or some, you know, menial task and strike it rich. There wasn't entrepreneurs. So her chance was to work in poverty her entire life, marry some schlub, uh, you know, peasant and die and have a whole bunch of kids and die. That was it. That was the life she, she was, she had in front of her or she could lie. And boy, does she lie. She lies, 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 and she's good at it. She's really, really good at it. And I think that's one of the fun things about the novel is that, you know, she does it because she doesn't really have a choice. Um, not if she wants to lead an interesting life. And I think that's why Daniel Defoe writes about her. So that's what I have to say about the immoral aspect. Meet, you get to meet this immoral, quote unquote, immoral woman, but she leads an interesting life. Otherwise, she would have led a bo boring, dull life and she would have died, you know, as a peasant. Maybe she would have, you know, just like that merrymaking um, Jan Steen. Uh, it's probably a guy, actually. I don't know why I think that's a guy. Um, that painting that I showed you, that would have been the highlight of her life is getting drunk, uh, passing out on the floor and, you know, having sex with some random person um, or with her husband or whatever in you know, upstairs in some, some person's house. That's the best she could have hoped for outside of this crazy life that she got to live. Okay, the third reason you might want to consider reading Mo Flanders. Understand vulgar materialism. Now, <laughs> this is um, tricky territory for me because I'm not a philosopher. There is materialism as a philosophical concept, which you know, is basically that or anti material there's materialism and there's anti-materialism and there's a whole bunch of philosophers from Plato on down who had different views on, you know, materialism. And, and that's a metaphysical view of how the whole world is either made up of stuff out there or is it just consciousness or is it, you know, some version of both of them, something like that. Now, by vulgar materialism in this sense, and, and there may even be a better word, and, and if you want to tell me in the comments some better words that I could have chosen, that's great. Maybe anti-commercialism is, you know, this is something that became really popular in the 19th century as commercialism grew, but it started in the 17th century. And it really, I, I would even argue it might start earlier than that. Iago in Othello, and Shakespeare's Othello says, put money on, in thy purse. And it's a very ironic, you know, that that's what you should do and he tell, when he really implies something else. He wants the character actually to try to seduce um, um, Desdemona. But he he's basically, you know, this idea of put money in thy pocket as that that's the only source of, of important of action in life. In other words, that there are no spiritual values. There's only material values. Only the material is important. And this gave rise to this whole concept that commercialism and, and, and all of the in capitalism, that the values of, of capitalism are mercenary, they are anti-spiritual, they are only about having the nicest house, the nicest clothes, the nicest car, and 
that became the bugbear, the boogeyman for every nasty concept you can think of. Now, let's step back a second. I believe one reason, one important reason to read novels, even if they're not novels that you necessarily love, right? They're not the most inspiring novels, is because they can tell you something about the world that other forms of art and other forms of getting this information about the world is impossible. So one of those things I've mentioned, which is getting the whole spectrum of a life. You can't do that anywhere outside of novels and um, you know epic p- f- uh, fiction. Another thing is that you know another thing was that I mentioned was historical relevance. Is you can learn actually some things about you know anthropologically. You can learn about the past in a way that you can't learn about the past. Um, you know, just in a history book, like you get a fuller visual because that's how fiction has to be written is it's written more visually and shows you what's going on. And you see real flesh and blood characters, if they're well drawn, acting these things out in this world. Another thing that you get on a deeper level that I think may be one of the more important things you get from reading literature is you get a concretization of philosophy in a way that you can't get it in a philosophy book. You get a concretization of philosophy in a way you cannot get in a philosophy book. Philosophy is important. We live by philosophy, whether we realize it or not. We all have a philosophical view on many things like fate, free will. You know, is there a God? Um, Is there such thing as right and wrong? You know, are, am I a determined being or am I free will? But, you know, those types of things we do have innate, you know, we do have implicit um, answers to, even if we can't verbalize them, we act in a way that, you know, this is the right thing to do. This is the wrong thing to do. I should go out to get that really expensive, you know, uh, high paying job because that's the right thing to do. Or I'm going to go get that high paying job, even though I know it's the wrong thing to do because I want the money, right? That is. We all have these things about philosophy. Reading novels can help you concretize and hold in your head, oh, this is what's meant by mercenary. This is what's meant by, you know, anti-capitalism, anti, um, you know, the values that capitalism puts out, that that commercialism puts out, that the, the, the trading culture, the industrial revolution, they put out these values these actions that we need to take in order to live a better life. And this is the opposite. This is the negative. This is the bad stuff. And so I, when I think of like, uh, when I was in college, I remember taking some philosophy. I minored in philosophy. I don't think I could have majored in it. I definitely couldn't get a master's or PhD in it. And I, um, there was, you know, most of my philosophy professors talked a lot about how evil commercialism was and, and the stuff that we read was all about, you know, like, look at all these night, you know, these ads, they would have these ads and they would show like, imagine an alien came here and this is what they saw. And it was like Coca-Cola and Bud Light and buy this car. And it was all about how evil commercialism was, how evil uh, capitalism was because the only values that of importance were not values of character. It was not about being a good person. It was not about, Helping your community it was not about helping your brother, you know, your your um the, the your neighbor. It wasn't about leading a good life and family. It was about buying, you know, a, a Mercedes, flying in a private jet, owning a big, nice, fancy house. Those are the values that they thought were implicit in, um, in in capitalism and and what it's from. And I think a lot. Of, and so for me, when I hold what they think of as a mercenary values of these vulgar, materialistic, anti-commercial values, I think of Maul Flanders because she is a good embodiment of living those values. And let me give you an example because you're probably thinking, Kirk, what the heck are you talking about? And um, so what she goes, she, remember she was married five times where of once to her brother. So the first time she's married it's actually in the house that she is adopted in. So she's a, she is eventually adopted by a very wealthy family. They, they find her humorous and cute. She grows up to be this absolutely stunning hot chick. Hot. You know, she's sexy. Guys want to have sex with her. One of the brothers of that family seduces her 
and has sex with her and gives her five guineas, by the way, which we'll talk about in a second. But the uh, but he basically just uses her. The other brother actually loved her, the younger brother. So she eventually marries the younger brother, even though she's in love with the older brother. And so one of the questions is, was it her fault? She was a young girl. She was taken advantage of. You know, when, we, when people call her Mal Flanders immoral, I don't know that this was her fault 100%. She was very young. But I don't think she was also 100% innocent, you know, at least not the way it's drawn. But that's you can read it to find out if you think I'm correct. But w- her husband, the younger, the younger one that she um, eventually marries, this is what ha- he dies five years later. Now, here's where it's interesting about the style and the context. There's like 40 pages of her, you know, a little bit of her growing up and getting adopted and being raised in this family. That's like the first five, 10 pages. But like 30 pages are spent on her, you know, one turning into a whore and falling in love. She, you know, fell in love with the older brother and all the machinations that she goes into where she's trying to get the best outcome that she can given the limited amount of options she has. And there's a lot of little things she does. She overhears this conversation. She tries to use that. She thinks that the older brother really loves her. She, but he, you know, over time basically debauches her and gets her to, you know, again, have sex with her for a couple of guineas. And, we'll, you know, we'll mention that in a second. And a lot of these machinations of what she's trying to get done. She says very little about the younger brother. Because, and, and she says very little about the five years she spent married to him. Here, she has one paragraph about the five years she was married to this good brother. Because again, to Daniel Defoe and I think to the Mall Flanders, that's not interesting. The stable life she had, that's not an interesting part of her life. That's, you know, she just lived a normal life for five years with this younger husband. And she had two children. Now, here's where the mercenary thing comes in. Here's where the vulgar capitalism, the bad values comes in. Here's what she says about her two children. My two children were indeed taken happily off my hands by my husband's father and mother. And that, by the way, was all they got by Mrs. Betty. We, by the way, we find out in page one that Mal Flanders is not her name. um, And we never know her real true name, by the way. Uh, So Mrs. Betty is what they called her. So it was a transaction. I had sex with your son. We were married for five years. We had two kids. That's the the value is not a spiritual value to Mal Flanders at all, and so she just gives them up happily to the uh, the parents, to to her husband's parents, to her, you know, um, the grandparents of the two children, and she does this again later with other kids, not with the the parents, but she gives the kids away, and this is what happened to Mal Flanders, by the way. Mal Flanders was given away to, um, you know. To, to the foster uh, st- uh, foster agency, or the, the ado- not adoption agency, but the, the foster care place. I don't remember what it was called at the time. So the, <laughs> this is what is meant, and, and this happens over and over again, where the marriages are not marriages for um, love. They're not marriages for building a family. They're not marriages for living as a good citizen in society. The marriages, all the marriages and the attempts at marriages that don't go through, every single one of them has a 100% transactional purpose for Mall Flanders. Every time. It's always about what can I get? How much, how many, uh, you know, guineas do I have? How many, there's, you know, um, I can't remember the money system. You know, how many silver pences do I have? How many gold florins or whatever I have? And she, in fact, let me see one second. Let me pull this up. Here, in fact, here's her conclusion that um, she has a, after the marriage. So she's reflecting on the marriage with the younger brother and the experience with the older brother. And she talks about, I had been tricked. You know, I had money in my pocket and had nothing to say to them. That's the, um, the parents. And it goes on to say, I had been tricked once by that cheat called love, but the game was over. And this is like, she's like 17 or 18. Or, or I, th- I guess at this point she's probably 22 because she was uh, with them together. And so that version of her as a, um, you know, trying to have everything be transactional is 
a great embodiment of the values and living a life where those are the ways, you know, the, the ends that you try to attain. One of the interesting things she does over and over again, every time she enters or exits a relationship or she goes into a potential relationship with some, th- someone, is in the book she writes her mental calculations of how much money she has, how long it will last, how she can use that money to manipulate some man into thinking she has you know, twice as much, five times, ten times as much money in order to nab a fortune hunter who is himself wealthy enough to make them go, uh, make them last, but is is also searching for a big, you know, uh, someone even wealthier that he can up his status. And that's a big part of the book is men as how uh, um as as fortune hunters, just like she is. And she lies to them all the time, trying to get them, but she does it in a very clever way. And you have to read it. And you know, I'd have to read you whole massive sections. She does it in a way where. She's always calculating, well, I'm not going to lie to them in such a way that they will um, know that I lied to them. So I will, you know, so she will joke about, no, I'm not rich. I'm poor. Are you you telling me you only want to be with me because I'm rich? And, you know, so she never really says she's rich, but she she kind of implies it. And then he says, no, 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 no. And then when she, you know, they get married and she's like, well, this is all I got. He's like. Well, wait a second, I thought you were rich. You're like, I never said I was, who said I was rich? Well, your friend said it, and this person, I never said it, did I? Didn't I tell you I was poor? Right, she does that all the time, and it's like, well, ah, I didn't know that, I didn't think about that. And But again, this is kind of the vulgar anti-materialism, the, the anti-commercialism. Uh, so when I think of those concepts philosophically, I think of Maul Flanders and the way that she acts and her mercenary methodology of living her life. I mean, she again, she does this over and over again. She tries to find ways and then, you know, to, to manipulate men to get her ends. And there are interesting cases where it works out against her. For instance, the one time she finds a man that she lives just or even more interesting life than she does, you know, he's he's basically, you know, he's been a brigand, a thief, he's been all over the place, um, living this adventurous lifestyle. Like a, and he does to her what she does to, to, is doing to him in lying about their fortunes. And then they get together and realize they're both not rich. And so they're going to have to separate. And then, but she realizes she loves him, but she can't be with him and pursue the values that she wants to, or she'll be ruined. And they use that word ruined all the time. And again, to them, ruined means that they're going to live as absolute poor peasants surviving hand to, you know, uh, hand to mouth. So I, you know, I, I have a hard time blaming Maul Flanders. When, pe- when I hear people attacking Maul Flanders, I have a little bit of a hard time with it because I don't think she had a ton of choice. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a taste of the, you know, philosophically why it's valuable to read books, even if they're not grand adventures or inspiring epics. And, you know, this is an, an epic of this woman's life who, lived that that introduction or the, the title that I read to you. She lived all of that. And this is her life. And I think it's interesting to read it just because you get to see her entirety of her life. And that goes to, you know, the fourth reason, um, or, or excuse me, the the yeah, novel as artistic achievement. So I think one other reason to read an early novel like this is somewhat purely literary. But this is a reason, so I'm going to put it out there, and it's one of the reasons I picked it up, is that this is one of the first novels, and and English novels especially. And it's explicitly written by a journalist, Daniel Defoe spent most of his life as a journalist, and he had particular aims in what he was trying to achieve in fictionalizing and aggregating all these observations that he saw in being a journalist and writing about you know, Newgate, which he actually had spent time in the prison himself. So he understood that world and he understood the peasants and the people. And he wanted to write something about those people, but he didn't want to write, you know, another expose type thing, which he had done before. He wanted to write something different. He wanted to write a fictionalized, totally made up version. Now, at this time, this was not something that was common in prose style as this is. So he put it 
as though it was a memoir of a real woman. And when you read it and when, you know, the beginning of it and even the preface that went along with it as was all designed to make people believe that this was a true story, but it was all made up, of course. And that's part of what I think is the beginnings of novels as an artistic achievement. It's moving from the realm of purely, you know, a journalistic creation and putting it into a fiction world. But in this case, in in the English speaking world, at least in prose. So often you would get this, you would get fiction would have to be in some kind of romantic verse of some sort. Um, and, and that's te- tended to be how you would get your fiction. But now we're getting this new style called the novel. It was new, novel. And this is, I think, interesting to see an early version of a novel in the English-speaking world. There were, of course, you know, considered what we def- how we define novels. There were other novels earlier that I think are important as well. Um, but that's just one reason, I think, is to see an early version of a novel. Okay, last reason. Understand the novel as moral institution. We don't see novels as moral institutions. We pretend like art is not moral, moralizing, but it is. Art uh, does give us characters to emulate or disdain, to actions to uh, admire or to avoid. And they do this in lots of ways. Sometimes they do this explicitly and telling you what you should and shouldn't do explicitly. And sometimes they do it implicitly, uh, you know, just because um, an author has to be a kind of observer of character of humans, and in order to embody those in a human character like Maul Flanders over the course of her life. And, you know, so there is a humanness to the way she's trying to use the value, live the value she lives by, which is she wants to be this kind of gentlewoman who's taken care of, but she has no options otherwise other than being poor or lying about it. And so this is the life of her lying about it. And one of the ways that Daniel Defoe got this kind of thing to go in 17th century England, or I think it was written in 1729, is he sold the book as a a moral... uh, um, guide to young women who may become corrupted. Because one of the things you see with uh, Maul Flanders over and over again is she gives little snide or little remarks, and they're sometimes a little snide, about how she, um, you know, some lesson she learned. So let me give you an example. Okay, here's one example um, when she basically gives into some inclinations, some sexual inclinations. And she says, um, you know, and it was owing to the accident of our having yielded too far to our mutual inclinations that night. And indeed, I have often observed since and leave it as a caution to the readers of this story that we owe, we ought to be cautious of gratifying our inclinations in loose and lewd freedoms lest we find our resolutions of virtue fail us in the juncture when their assistance should be most necessary. So she, she kind of is giving, um, now the question is, of course, is she sincere in this? But she's giving a kind of advice to young women who might be reading this of be careful of not letting vanity, she'll say often, you know, I saw that for vanity, um, you know, when she was first given the, the guineas, she kept it instead of throwing it in his face because she said she was kind of proud that she was able to get this, right? And so she's saying, well, vanity became a kind of negative thing that corrupted me. And when she becomes a thief, one of the reasons, or the main reason she becomes a thief later in life is because she can no longer uh, um, convince men to marry her because her looks have gone. So that was the major reason, the major way she could attract a man was not only did she pretend like she had money, but she was also attractive. And we get over and over again in this story the weird values of 16th century, 17th century London, or weird, I think, to us, that your mistresses could be attractive, your wife had to be rich. 
And that's all that really mattered. That's what people tried to value is the person you married had to be rich, but you could sleep with people on the side who you were actually physically and, and emotionally attracted to. And again, this goes to the source of that anti uh, commercialism that I was talking about earlier as well. And this is part of the idea of the novel as a moral institution. And, you know, that we don't see it, or we do see it today as well, but not in the same way. And I think it's uh, to the detriments of novels. Okay, so there's a lot more I could say about this novel. I think it is worth reading. I think the main reason is to read it is because you will see the interesting life of this woman and all the adventures she goes through, the machinations. And for me, whenever I hear someone talk about the anti or the materialistic world that we live in in America, that's all about um, you know making money. I think of Mall Flanders. That's that whole. I I can visualize her and the way she lives all in one you know uh, one visual one thing right before my eyes. As here is what they are talking about. This is what they hate. And you can kind of sympathize with that they hate that this is, you know, that she's not leaving, leading a great, life, a happy life. She's constantly manipulating and just getting by, you know, uh, she, she's surviving during the, their marriages. There's no happiness in those marriages. There's no love. There's no romanticism. There's no, you know, it's all about getting, again, getting her money and making sure she has enough money to live a decent life. And this even happens when she becomes a thief. She becomes really good as a thief and she becomes famous. And that's why, you know, the, the famous and infamous, uh, the fortunes and misfortunes of the famous Maul Flanders. She becomes famous as a thief. And Maul Flanders is her thief name, by the way. And that embodies the second half of the, the novel. The point is, uh, and then she's eventually captured and she goes to uh, Virginia where she actually is able to uh, lead a, a decent life at the very end of her life. But she, again, so the point is she doesn't get to have those, you know, spiritual values. And for me, this is how I hold it in my mind when I hear that. So that's what I have to say about Maul Flanders. You know, if you read it, let me know. Well, let me know what you think. Um, and I, I think that's an interesting, um, you know, it's an interesting story worth reading. Again, check out TroubadourMag.com, Literary Canon Club. Maul Flanders is actually not on our list of uh, books to read um, for the literary canon, the Western literary canon. Uh, if you want to find out what's on that list, go to that website up above, TroubadourMag.com, Literary Canon Club, um, and you can reserve your spot, and I will send you the list of all the works, even if you decide not to become a member. So thank you very much, and I will see you next time.